Welcome to AP Chemistry. Hi there, my name is Jeremy Krug, and I'm going to be your guide through the fantastic yet challenging journey that is AP Chemistry. As you probably already know, AP Chem is a tough course, but I'm going to do my best to make this class as accessible and understandable to you as it can possibly be. You're watching video number one in a playlist of 103 videos that you can use to learn the entire AP Chem curriculum. Now, before we get started, I want to tell you about some important resources designed to accelerate your success this year. First of all, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Check out my chemistry playlists. Of course, the full AP Chemistry course playlist has all your daily videos, but I also have a playlist for review resources and exam tips to get you ready for the big day in May. I have a playlist just for free response question explanations. And if you're just starting out in AP Chem, check out my Unit Zero playlist, Getting Ready for AP Chemistry, to practice some basic skills that you need to know going into the school year. I've also prepared the ultimate review packet for AP Chemistry. Now this is a comprehensive digital packet to help you get ready for both your unit exams and the AP exam in May. The ultimate review packet has the full guided notes for my YouTube videos. So you can watch the videos right here on YouTube and use those guided notes to follow along, take notes, and work the practice problems with me. The ultimate review packet has an exclusive 30-minute review video for each unit. You'll find unit study guides and practice problems and detailed answer keys, hundreds of AP-style practice questions, both multiple choice and free response, exclusive tips and tricks to help you score your best, access to exclusive live streams just for Ultimate Review Packet subscribers, two full practice AP exams with detailed answer keys and explanations for every single question. And if you want extra practice beyond the Ultimate Review Packet, I've also created the Ultimate Exam Slayer, where you'll find even more practice questions and two completely different full practice AP exams. To get the Ultimate Review Packet, the Exam Slayer, or both, just head over to ultimatereviewpacket.com and click on AP Chemistry, or scan this QR code. If you're serious about doing great this year in AP Chemistry, then you're in the right place. This is the place for all things AP Chemistry. Now, let's jump right into Unit 1, Topic 1, which covers moles and molar mass. It's really appropriate that we start our journey into AP Chemistry with the discussion of the mole. This is the fundamental unit of substance that we use in all of chemistry, the mole. And basically, a mole is defined as a very, very large number of objects. In fact, it's a little bit over 600 to sextillion objects. That is an unimaginably large number. Now, it's so large we normally write that in scientific notation. We write it as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd items. That's how many objects or things there are in one mole. If we start thinking about how big that number is, it really stretches our imagination. For example, if you had 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd grains of rice, you know, grains of rice are very, very small. Well, that many grains of rice would actually be enough rice to fill all the land area on the entire planet to a depth of about 250 feet. So we're talking about a huge amount of rice. In fact, that's more rice than has been grown since the beginning of human history, a huge amount. If we had that many hockey pucks, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd hockey pucks, that would have about the same mass as the moon. So we're talking about a huge uh, number here. On the other hand, if you were to have that many molecules of water, imagine about 600 to sextillion molecules of water. Well, that would not be nearly as much. That's actually about 18 milliliters of water, about six tenths of an ounce. Now, this number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, is called Avogadro's number. It's called that in honor of Amadeo Avogadro. He was a scientist who did some research that helped uh, pave the way for the discovery of that number. Very important for us. 
However, this idea, this, this thought experiment here helps us hopefully to appreciate two things. First of all, it should help us to appreciate how unimaginably large Avogadro's number is. That number 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd is an unimaginably large number. It should also help us to appreciate how unimaginably tiny atoms and molecules are because you know that many molecules of water, you know, a very, very small amount, would not even quench your thirst. So as we talk about a mole, one mole of an element, say carbon, for example, is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. That's what a mole of carbon is. If you were to have a mole of water, on the other hand, well, we don't measure uh, water in units of atoms. We say molecules of water since it's a compound. So a mole of water would mean 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. That's how that would work. If you have something like NaCl, salt, sodium chloride, well that's not technically a molecule, it's an ionic compound. So the unit we use to talk about ionic compounds is called the formula unit. So one mole of sodium chloride would actually involve 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of sodium chloride. So we use the corresponding unit for whatever substance we're talking about. If we have, let's say, uh, a molecule of bromine, one mole of Br2 would be, yeah, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of Br2, bromine. If we had ions like sodium cations, for example, one mole of Na+, would involve 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd sodium ion. So we use whatever unit we're talking about. In fact, we can say that one mole of anything is going to include 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd fundamental units of that substance, whatever it might happen to be. It might be atoms, molecules, formula units, ions, whatever we're dealing with. Now let's use this concept to solve a couple of problems. How many molecules of carbon dioxide would be found in 0 0.380 moles of that substance? Well, this is basically a unit conversion problem. We did dimensional analysis back in those unit zero videos. If you haven't had a chance to watch that, or if you're not too sure of yourself on dimensional analysis, you can jump back and watch that video. But if we have 0 0.380 moles of CO2, we start by writing that down, just like we have here. And since we're converting to molecules, way down here at the end, we're gonna write molecules of CO2. And in our conversion factor, since we're starting with moles, we have to put moles on the bottom. That way it'll cancel out. And since we're converting to molecules, well, we put molecules on the top. And we know, we've just said, that one mole of CO2 has 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So now all we have to do is cancel moles, top and bottom, just like this. And on our calculator, we can take 0 0.380 and multiply this by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And when you key that into your calculator, the answer is 2.29 times 10 to the 23rd. So that's how we can solve a problem like this. Now we can go in the other direction as well. Let's say we have this problem. A sample of 1.02 times 10 to the 24th ions of calcium 2 plus is equivalent to how many moles? Well, we start by writing down what's given to us. The 1.02 times 10 to the 24th ions of Ca2 plus. And this time we're trying to convert to moles. So way down at the end, we're going to write moles of Ca2 plus. And in our conversion factor, we have to put ions on the bottom this time and we're converting to moles, so moles will go on the top. And we know that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd ions in one mole of this substance. So now we can just cancel ions top and bottom, and we can divide this time. We take 1.02 times 10 to the 24th, and we divide that by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And we get an answer of about 1.69 moles of Ca2 plus. So we can uh, calculate those fairly simply, as you can see here. Now, just a little uh, point that I want you to realize. I'm trying to be consistent on my significant figures here. So for example, in the question, 
up here in the first example, I had three significant figures. So in the answer, notice I have an answer with three significant figures. Likewise, in the second example, I had three significant figures in the question. So I put three significant figures in my answer. So I try to be consistent with significant figures as much as I can. Now, let's think about another way to talk about a mole. We know that it's really not practical to actually count atoms and molecules. If we had a sample of an element, no one's going to sit there and say, how many atoms are, are in that sample? How many molecules are there? No one's going to sit and start counting, you know, one atom, two atoms, three atoms, four. That would take forever. It would be ridiculous to count atoms in a sample of matter, basically. It's more practical to talk about what is the mass of a mole of something. How many grams are there in one mole? And fortunately, the periodic table makes this quite easy for us. If we take any periodic table square, all we have to do is look at the atomic mass. So in the case of copper, the mass of one mole of that element is just 63.546 grams. So basically, whatever the atomic mass is expressed in grams is the mass of one mole of that element. So pretty easy to do that. Pretty easy to, to determine that. If we have a compound, it's pretty much the same thing. We just have to take the sum of those atomic masses. So if we have salt, NaCl, sodium chloride, we take the two individual atomic masses of sodium and chloride and we add them together. So we take 22.99 and we add that to 35.45 and we get a total of about 58.44 grams. And so we call that the molar mass of the substance. The molar mass of copper is 63.546 grams. The molar mass of sodium chloride is 58.44 grams, the mass of one mole. Notice that I, I normally try to round these numbers off to two decimal places. That's a, a fairly reasonable uh, way to round these off. If you round off too much, sometimes you might incorporate some rounding errors into your problems and you might end up being a little bit off from the correct answer. So I, I normally try to round off to two decimal places on these atomic masses, on these molar masses. Now, we can do the same thing for compounds. If we think about ionic compounds, they have a formula mass. If we think about this on the much tinier, the submicroscopic scale, we can think about the formula mass. For example, Al2O3, aluminum oxide. What is the mass of one formula unit of that? Well, we just take the atomic masses. There are two atoms of aluminum at about 26.98 apiece. We get 53.96. And we add in three oxygens at about 16.00 apiece. And when you add that together, we find that the formula mass of aluminum oxide is about 101.96 atomic mass units. That's the mass of one formula unit of aluminum oxide. Very, very tiny. 101.96 atomic mass units. Now, if the question were, what's the molar mass? Well, we'd say it's 101.96 grams in a mole. It's done the same way, except molar mass is expressed in grams. Formula mass is expressed in atomic mass units. It's a, it's a slight difference there. If we have another ionic compound like magnesium nitrate, done the same way. We have one atom of magnesium. It has a mass of about 24.31. We have two nitrogens here at 14.01 apiece. And we have six oxygens. You know, three times two is six. And that's at about 16.00 units apiece for 96. And when you add those together, we can find that the formula mass of magnesium nitrate is about 148.33 atomic mass units, AMU. And once again, if the question were, what's the molar mass of magnesium nitrate? We'd say it's 148.33 grams in a mole. Done the same way, you know, the same process, except formula mass is in AMU, molar mass 
is in grams. Now we can do the same thing for molecular compounds, except instead of saying formula mass, we say molecular mass. So probably the most common molecular compound that we're familiar with is water, H2O. We can find the molecular mass of water pretty simply. You know, the atomic mass of hydrogen is about 1.008. I'll be a little bit more specific on that one, more precise. We got two atoms of that, so that's about 2.016. We have one atom of oxygen at 16.00. And so when you add these two together, you find that the molecular mass of water is about 18.02 AMU. And the molar mass of water is 18.02 grams of water. So I can weigh out one mole of water, 18.02 grams of water, and I can point to that and say that's one mole of water. That's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water right there in that sample, 18.02 grams of water. It's called counting by weighing. We can actually count out the number of molecules that we have there by weighing it. And we can do this for other more complex molecules as well, like sucrose, table sugar. It has the formula C12H22O11. You know, uh, carbon has the atomic mass of 12.01. We have 12 of those, and so we have that. We have 22 hydrogen atoms at 1.008 apiece, and we have 11 oxygen atoms at 16 apiece. When you add those together, we find that the molecular mass of sucrose, table sugar, is about 342.30 atomic mass units. The molar mass of sucrose, table sugar, is 342.30 grams in one mole. Like I said, same process, it's just different unit. Hey, I hope you learned something about moles and molar mass and Avogadro's number and how we do some of those problems as well. If you learned something from my video, please slam that thumbs up button. That way my videos will get shared with other great AP Chemistry students just like you who are starting out in this fantastic journey. I uh, hope to see you in the next video where we're going to learn some more applications of molar mass and how we can do some conversion problems with that. Hey, I'll see you in that next video. Thanks for watching.